Hey everyone, it's Tim Clausen here from Central Heights Church. We're in the beginning of a series on Genesis chapters one to three, entitled Right from the Start. Uh, one of the sessions is on faith and science. And so today we thought it'd be really great to have a conversation with our special guest, Andy Steiger, who's from Apologetics Canada. Andy, you're the founder, I believe, and president. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that really means and uh, how, how you got into this? Yeah, what that really means is I work a lot. It's is pretty much what it means. So I did. I, my wife and I founded the organization eleven years ago. I was finishing a master's degree and really looking for God's direction in my life. I've I've now pastored for for twenty years, uh, and at that point, at that point, of course, it was it was only uh, around ten years. But asking Lord, where where would you have me go? And I thought it'd be the mission field. And in many ways, it was back to Canada. At that time, I was in Los Angeles, back to Canada, uh, really to help the church um, just engage with where culture was at. At that time, we were, a lot of young people were leaving the faith and wanted to, wanted to speak into that. So I was working in Los Angeles with an organization called apologetics.com. I thought, hey, I could be apologetics.com in Canada. And then we dropped the .com. We just became apologetics Canada, which I later kind of thought, wow, it's a pretty grandiose title we, we gave ourselves, right? Like Apologetics Canada. And I can actually say though these days that we've lived up to that because now we have, a, we have two staff in Ontario. We have one staff in Alberta. And then there's two of us, uh, actually three of us here in British Columbia. Oh, that's so good. And I, I just want to say, I think you're brilliant. And that's also, very kind, you think? also relatable. Uh, I've read both of, I don't know if you've published more than two books, but I've read Thinking, and I've also read Reclaimed and found myself highlighting lots of sentences and whatnot in there. So yeah, you've, you've had a really positive impact on, uh, you know, my perspectives. And so I'm really grateful to have this opportunity. We want to talk about faith and science. Maybe we should start with definitions. Uh, so how, how would you help us understand, you know, how to look at those two terms? Yeah. And maybe we should throw a third term in there. Um, I, I should probably quickly just define apologetics. Sure. It's, it's for those who are unfamiliar with it. It's a Greek word. It's found in our Bibles. Apologia means to give an answer or a reason as, as it's used by Paul and the apostle Peter, uh, for the hope that we have in Jesus. So, uh, that that you know that concept actually play a part i'm sure of this discussion at, at some level mm -hmm. but the way that i define science in faith uh might be of of a surprise to some but i i, I define science very broadly as uh as an act of exploration and discovery into the unknown so an act of exploration and discovery into the unknown and i define faith as trusting what you have good reason to believe is true. Mm. And, and I say that because as you probably know, Tim, there's a lot of people that have this mistaken notion of faith is, uh, is some sort of pie in the sky, uh, you, you know, this kind of what we would often coin it or talk about is blind faith. It's just mm -hmm. this complete it, it's this trust, but no good reason for that trust. And that's where apologetics, right? Is that good reason to, yeah. to place your trust? I remember being on a flight once talking with the woman beside me and shared a bit about my Christian faith. And she said, good for you. Good for you. And I, I couldn't leave it at that. I said, no, 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 <laughs> just a minute. It, it's not, it, it's based on something. Like there's a reason for this belief. Uh, you know, it's a, it's founded in, in history and logic and, Lead, you know, it all leads us to something that that's compelling. So, yeah. And maybe on that note, I should just say that uh, as I'm as I'm defining science in these ways, and even in faith, as I'm looking at these, this is from years of study. So, I, as you know, I just recently finished my PhD, which was five years worth of work, and that that, and then of course, there's all sorts of other work that I've done. But the person I did my PhD work in. His name is Michael Polani, and he was a scientist. First, he was a medical doctor that became a physical chemist, and then he went on into philosophy and ultimately dabbled in theology. So if people are wondering, you know, why am I defining science the way I am? Well, I'm defining it from that perspective, from, from my doctoral work, and, and I'm sure it's going to engage at some level in the conversation we have here. But that's it. That's the, 
the street cred for for why I'm defining science in that specific way. Well, I think the the whole idea of exploration and discovery is really helpful. So, yeah. So thinking of those two terms, science, faith, uh, in your experience, what is the mood out there in the relationship between those two? The, the mood that I have encountered from the last you know, 11 years of doing apologetics uh, Canada is just confusion. Uh, I have seen confusion on, uh, on both uh, perspectives. So I've seen uh, confusion amongst scientists of, of how to view faith. And I've seen people of faith with confusion on how to view scientists. And I'll never, Tim, I'll never forget a conversation that I had once, once with a lady that attended our church. And she told, she was a scientist, uh, a geologist, in fact, and was explaining to me that when she went to work, that she would put on a science hat and that when she would come to church, she would put on her faith hat. And she saw these as two separate things that, that, that didn't come together and shouldn't come together. And that's when, I, that's when I realized, man, we should probably talk more about this. So I'm actually really thankful that you're having this, you know, this series at your church because it's, so, it's a needed conversation. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's funny because my next question was going to be for a Christian how should science and faith really work together? Yeah. Now, there's a lot that could be said on, on that subject, but let me just maybe tackle two things with regards to that. Mm -hmm. First, I think it's important for the scientists to realize that faith is a part of science. And a lot of people don't think in that regard, but it's, it's fundamental. For example, when a scientist or a student goes to, to university, for example, to become a scientist, they are learning a, in a tradition and they're taking information on faith. They, they are going to hear many things that they're not going to go and do experiments on themselves. They're going to take it on faith that what was done was done correctly and that they're being told truth. Right. So, so there is that faith component. They're putting trust and to the, the profs and into this, this system, if you will, as they're getting educated. But then there's a much deeper level of trust that's taking place with, for a scientist. And that is, and this is a part that a lot of people don't think about, that you are a person that is using your five senses to, again, explore and discover in the universe. But that isn't, again, an exercise of faith. You're, you have, you're, you're required to trust that your five senses are working accurately and that your mind is able to engage with the world and, and that you, in fact, can explore and discover truth. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, in fact, it almost, my mind started thinking about it automatically assumes that there is more than just materialism. If it's just, if it's just neurons firing and atoms at work, then actually logic doesn't make sense. So I think just by you saying that automatically made me think of how important both worlds are really. Well, because, and maybe we could just put it this way, science requires a scientist, mm -hmm. but what's the worldview that you're going to be able to substantiate that scientists exist or what even constitutes a scientist. Now, on the flip side, with regards to faith, I think it's important that people of faith realize that science is an important, an important act, that, that, that God has spoken to us through two books. Uh, in fact, I, actually could meet, I think you could actually say three books, but uh, the, the um, book of God's words, the Bible, and then the book of God's works, nature. And the reason I threw a third one in there is I think morality is, is, doesn't fit neatly into, into those right. in that morality is something that we encounter when we come into relationship with persons. That's a totally different conversation, but I just, I figured I would throw it in right. there. Now, I did want to just say one more thing that I think might be helpful for people on how to understand how faith and science work. And this is a distinction that's actually found in science itself. And it's the distinction between pure science and applied science. And, and I think if, if I'm just going to explain these, and if, you, and if you just can grasp this, this concept between pure and applied science, 
I think then uh, a Christian understands well how they fit into science and the scientists can understand well how Christianity fits into mm -hmm. the whole picture. So pure science is what happens in say the field of physics. It's where we, it's where we study the parts of the world and the physical laws that those parts follow. That's called pure science. Now, applied science would be under the, the heading of like engineering. And, and that is the science of which we are studying how you can take the parts of this world and put them together into structural or composite holes to achieve a purpose. Now, one of the ways that you can distinguish with whether or not you're doing pure science or applied science is whether or not that structure can fail. So when we're talking about pure science, as we know, nature's laws stay consistent. Gravity's so, gravity. Gravity's gravity. It doesn't fail. Whereas a spaceship, right? It's an engineered structure with a purpose that can fail. It can fail to achieve its purpose. Now, that distinction between pure science and applied science is, I think, a helpful framework for us to start to understand where we fit, where, where, where Christianity fits into this whole thing. Because, Tim, we could ask a question with those two categories, right? We could ask, where does biology fit into this conversation then? Is biology pure science or is it applied science? What, what would you say as, as you would just grapple with that question? Let's see if I'm a good student. <laughs> All I'd say is pure science because you're, you're examining what is. It's right when now, you, it's, it's maybe when you, when you take it, when you're trying to create something different, then that would be applied science. Right. So now let's, now let's think about this. I think it, uh, Ultimately, what you're getting at is that it can be both. Okay, but don't make don't make me look like a fool here, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. You're on the right track. You're on the right okay, track. Okay, it, okay. Uh, biology could could be both. It could be pure science, in that we can reduce a um, some some you know biological structure such as uh, a bacteria. We right. could reduce it down to its parts that it's made of and the physical laws that it's following. Yeah. Or we can also look at that structure as achieving something. Right. And we can then look at it as a composite or structural whole as an engineered object. So what happens, and this is where the confusion really comes in, is what is the underlying foundational worldview that I'm approaching my science with? If I hold to a belief that the world, like you said earlier, is just physical, well, then that's going to inform the way I'm going to study biological structures. I'm only going to see them as physical. And it's in that worldview of physicalism or scientism that physics is often called the queen of the sciences. And, and notice physics is in the camp of pure science. So everything then gets reduced down to its parts in an attempt to understand what it is. Right. But that raises questions about, well, how are we supposed to understand the purpose of a structure if all I can do is look at its parts? Right. Now, I hope I haven't gotten too complicated here, but that would be like reading a book. Maybe it's a, lang maybe it's a foreign language to you. And, and assuming that if you could reduce a book down to its atomic level, that you could learn Spanish, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think you can realize like quite quickly, it's like, no, you've, that's like a categorical error. Like the, the parts are different from the whole. Right. So we yeah. could say then that there is a difference between the parts that a thing is made of and the purposeful whole that a thing is made for. So depending upon what your perspective is, is going to determine how you're going to actually see science from either a top-down perspective or a bottom-up perspective. Okay. okay, I have uh, two more questions for you. And one actually just, as you're talking about applied and pure, where does examining what happened way back when, origins, origins, uh, what kind of science is that? Well, 
um now are we talking say like the book of genesis sort of thing yeah or yeah because we're going through genesis at central heights when yeah you know, you, when we start to have conversations around the science, around determining how did this really happen? What mm -hmm. kind of science is that? That's, it's a, not, so that's it's, a great question. Because it's not something we can put in a test tube right now and, and you know, and examine. It's almost like we're, yeah. we're playing detective. So when we look at the book of Genesis, we can ask the question, are, is the Bible doing pure science or is the Bible doing applied science? And so remember, the distinction between the two is pure science doesn't fail. Applied science can fail. So, and remember, applied science is dealing with the purpose that a thing's created for. It's a structure that's created for a purpose. And so this is kind of cool, because when we look at Genesis chapter one, it tells us immediately what we're dealing with here. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the word created the idea of creation is an act of intention and and the act of uh, of intention is an act of purpose in mm -hmm. other words to create something is to to is an act of purpose the two are synonymous and so what you see right from the get-go in genesis is that the bible's telling you about the the purpose of what was constructed uh, for example, the universe, but but notice how the Bible starts with like, okay, it's this universe, but it but it begins to narrow on who the main characters are, particularly humans and God, and then you start to see how this this um, purpose doesn't go correctly, right? How you have brokenness, you have evil. There's this relationship that's created, but that relationship becomes broken, and now this whole story unfolds of what is God going to do to reconcile this relationship. And, and so you can begin to see then that in the Bible, the Bible is looking at this from an ap applied science perspective, mm -hmm. whereas the pure science perspective is that is that second book, right? That book of God's works. And one of the things that's so encouraging uh, as you do academic studies, you see that Christians have loved both books. They've loved throughout history. They've loved looking at what God has created with his works, but also what he's done with his words. Uh, as we look at things both bottom up and top down, does that does that make sense, Tim? Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, one of the things I was going to ask you was because you used to pastor young adults, and you often hear how going to university sometimes the faith of young adults is put to the test and they deconstruct yeah. uh, on the question of science and faith. What sort of advice would you give them? Yeah, that, that's such a, an important question. It was interesting. I was just uh, talking with a friend of na mine named Michael. He is a PhD student at the University of Saskatchewan in the topic of, uh, of uh, quantum gravity. Uh, and, and, I, and I say that because you have to understand, Michael loves Jesus dearly, and yet he is a top science, like he is, he's in the sciences on one of the most cutting edge subjects that there is. And, and it was interesting because he and I were talking recently and he was saying, you know, Andy, so, so many young people, myself, him included and my own myself in my own academic work, you know, we've grown up not really seeing how these two interrelate, right? Like, what do I need to know, in other words, as a young adult that's heading into university so that so that I can kind of move, you know, maneuver my way through this maze if you will and here so i would say that there's three things that i would just encourage young people with um as i've thought on this subject and as i've talked with other people like like michael on the subject and the first thing i would say is this is first uh, you need to be careful that there is misinformation in the university uh it, it's it's kind of like that that problem that you can face on social media where right where you've got yeah, everywhere uh, yeah, you can find it everywhere. And you think, oh, this this sort of, you know, uh, misinformation is only on social media. It's like, well, no, it actually isn't. It's it's actually even in uh, the university. And I'm amazed at, at what I what I have found with regards to this. So just quickly here, there is this concept called the conflict thesis. It right. was created in the 19th century by two individuals, John Draper and Andrew White. And basically, they invented the idea that religion and science are in conflict with each other. And 
th this is one of those things where it just takes a Google search to see that virtually no historian believes that the conflict thesis is, is accurate. But yet you can still, and I've encountered it being taught at the university, because for some people, it is a narrative that I think they just want to be true. Mm -hmm. But academic research shows, in fact, is not true. But it means that you as the student, you've got to do some work. You just can't take everything that you're being told uh, at face value. Uh, one of the things that people might find interesting about that conflict thesis, there's, there's a number of things that have crept into our, our thinking because of these guys, one of which is the subject uh, that people in the past thought that the world was flat, which uh, what, what you find is that the Greeks knew that the world was round. They had calculated the circumference of the earth very closely and that many uh, that people by and large knew that the world was round and they had various arguments. You can read, read medieval thinkers and they'll tell you their arguments for why uh, way before Columbus, why mm -hmm. they believed that the earth was round. Um, and I'd love to share some of those with you, but I'll keep moving to, my, right. <laughs> to the second point. Uh, the, the second thing that I think uh, that we need to just keep in mind for young people is that Christianity has a robust intellectual tradition. And so for, for myself and people like Michael, again, when I've looked deeply into these things, it's encouraged my faith. It hasn't discouraged me. But it means that I have to, again, have to do a little bit more work because so often you'll read somebody like John Locke or you'll read Thomas Hobbes or you'll read Newton or many others. And you'll mm -hmm. only get just a slice of their ideas. And it's very easy to forget that these people were operating from a religious often Christian perspective that informed their view. It might surprise people to learn that John Locke liked apologetics. And he even wrote a book called The Reasonableness for Christianity. Mm. And, and again, I could go on and on about this. You start to see a much more whole, whole view, a, a, a holistic view of the history when you start to put those yeah. pieces together. We've got such a truncated narrative, don't we? They make good yeah, sound and, bites. They make good sound bites, but they don't give you a full perspective. Yeah. I mean, because that's that's something that can be interesting. Just taking Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan, for example. I mean, the the a small section of that is is on political theory, but a large part of it, the majority of it, is on his faith. And again, it's just one of those things where you start to realize that that people in the past brought their faith into the discussion way more than we do today. And I, I if anything, I just want to encourage young people to bring their that's faith great. into the conversation. And so that leads to my third point, my last point, and that would be go into education with a desire to, to be inspired uh, and to participate in your education with your faith, letting your faith give you both a top-down perspective and the freedom of a bottom-up perspective so that we can see things from a purposeful view. But that also means that I can even set that aside and I could just look at the parts too and I could study the laws that they follow. Like I could take a small view of things, but I can take a large view of things and to see when it's appropriate that those two interact um, as they should. That's super helpful. Hey, if you were to recommend a few resources to read, look at, uh, what would you wanna uh, leave people with? Yeah, there are two books that we're recommending right now at Apologetics Canada. Uh, one is called The Light Ages. So obviously playing off of that, um, commonly misunderstood idea of the dark ages mm -hmm. uh so that book's called the light ages that is um an, an incredible uh an incredible read that has really encouraged uh me just because i i love the i love details and and he takes the time to show you how christians uh were involved in the founding of the university and how they were uh, foundational in science and where we are today and how their faith interacted directly with that development. Uh, and I don't, I don't even think that writer is, is a Christian. He's, he's a professor at Cambridge University uh, by the name of Falk. Uh, but yeah, he's just telling you like, this is, this is the way it is. When you look at history, this is, this is what you find. And then the other book is um, called The Soul of Science that I would recommend. And with regards to those two books, uh, Apologetics Canada is doing something called The Literary Expedition on November 7th where we're just encouraging people who want to have a conversation with us about this important subject of science and faith, uh, that we're going to talk about it both historically and currently uh, on November 7th. It's going to be a virtual event that people could yes. join us. That sounds exciting. Now, should people read those books in advance? That'd be helpful. 
they can do both. They could read those books in advance and then participate in the discussion, uh, or they could just come and be a fly on the virtual just, wall and just okay. listen. ApologeticsCanada.com. Yep, you'll find all the information there under literary under events, literary expeditions, and you can sign up there. Okay. Hey, Andy, I, again, I want to thank you for taking the time for this. I think it's been very helpful and encouraging. Uh, you've encouraged me. And uh, yeah, I just, God bless you for the work you're doing. I know it's having a huge impact. And um, yeah, God bless you, your work and your family. And thanks again for spending this time with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tim. And okay. uh, appreciate it. Okay, take care.